Hi, I'm William Urey. I'm co-founder of Harvard's program on negotiation, co-author of Getting to Yes, and author most recently of Possible, How We Survive and Thrive in an Age of Conflict. I was trained as an anthropologist, and I've spent the last 45 years working as a negotiation advisor and mediator in some of the world's toughest conflicts, from the Cold War to the Middle East, from bitter coal strikes to boardroom battles, from partisan political fights to civil wars around the world. A few years ago, I was taking a hike in the mountains with my friend Jim Collins, well-known author of leadership classics like Good to Great, when he suddenly turned to me and asked, William, do you think you could sum up the essence of all that you've learned about negotiation and dealing with difficult conflicts in a single sentence? Well, I looked at him quizzically, but I thought about it, and on our next hike, I gave it my best try. And Jim looked at me and said, now go write the book. If I were a Martian anthropologist right now looking at humanity, I would say we live in a time of great paradox. Never before in human evolution have we enjoyed such an abundance of opportunities to solve the world's problems and live the life that we want for ourselves and our children. And yet at the same time, with the rapid changes and disruptions brought about by technological change like AI, geopolitical conflicts, domestic political polarization, economic crises, environmental crises, and so on, we face a wave of destructive conflict that's beginning to polarize every facet of our lives from our workplaces to our families, to our community, to our world. And it's paralyzing our ability to work together and solve our problems. So my question is, how do we navigate this stormy time so that we can realize the enormous opportunities that we have at hand? Well, first, I would say we need to be realistic. We are not going to end conflict. Conflict is probably going to increase. Nor should we end conflict because, speaking as an anthropologist, I would say conflict is something natural. It's, uh, it's part of life. And in fact, we may actually need more conflict, not less. And by that, I mean the healthy conflict that allows us to engage our differences productively, to grow, and to change what needs to be changed, including to address all the injustices around us. So the choice we face it's not to get rid of conflict. It's how to transform it. It's how to handle it in a different way. Because all too often, we tend to fall right into what I would call the three A trap. The first A stands for attack, which usually provokes counterattack. And as Gandhi once said, an eye for an eye, and we all go blind. The second A stands for avoid. We just kind of ignore the problem, hoping it's going to go away, which doesn't solve anything. And the third A stands for accommodate. We give in. And often we do all three things. We avoid for a while. We give in. We, we even accommodate. And then we lose it. We go on the attack. Does that sound at all familiar? I mean, think about your own natural learning edge. You know, do you, do you accommodate? Do you attack? Do you... Do you avoid? What is yours? And so the question is, what's the way out of this 3A trap? I would suggest it's to do the exact opposite of avoiding, which is actually to lean into the conflict with curiosity, to embrace it with creativity, and to transform it with collaboration. And by transform, I simply mean to change the form of conflict from destructive strife and fighting into constructive, creative negotiation. As I look back and reflect on the toughest conflicts I've been involved in in the course of my life, from apartheid in South Africa, to war between Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland, to civil war in Colombia, what I see is that the conflict often continues, but the key thing is that the war ends, the conflict is transformed. So my question is, what do we need to do to transform our conflicts and navigate these very challenging times? I would suggest that we need three things above all. We need perspective. 
something that I, I use the metaphor of going to the balcony, which I'll explain in a moment. We need a way out, a bridge, and we're going to need often lots of help from others around us, the third side. So let's just take them one at a time. Let's start with perspective for a moment. When it comes to conflict, we are often our own worst enemies. What I've learned over these years, decades, is that the biggest obstacle to getting what I want in a negotiation is not what I think it is. It's not the difficult person on the other side of the table. It's the person on this side of the table. It's me. <laughs> it's the person I look at in the mirror every morning. It lies in our very natural, very human, very understandable tendency to react, to, to act without thinking, to act out of fear and anger. We human beings, were reaction machines. And as the old saying goes, when you're angry, you will make the best speech you will ever regret. You will send the best email you will ever regret. So what's the alternative? It's to do the exact opposite of reacting, which is to pause for a moment. It's to think about what you really want and how you can get there. Imagine yourself for a moment on a stage and go to the balcony. The balcony is simply a metaphor for a place of calm where you can keep your eyes on the prize and see the bigger picture. In other words, negotiation is an inside game. It starts from the inside out. And the best way to start the negotiation is by stopping. Start by stopping. So that sets, up, that sets us up for the next challenge which is how do we find a way out? In today's tough conflicts, we need more than ever to be able to go to find a way out of the labyrinth of destructive fights because the other side may be far from cooperative. They may be digging in and refusing to budge, pressuring, attacking, threatening. What do we do? Their position, their mind is far away from yours. It's like there's this huge chasm between where you are and where they are. And that chasm is filled with fear, anger, doubt, unmet needs, distrust, baggage from the past. Our challenge is to build a bridge over that chasm. Not just an ordinary bridge, but a golden bridge. In other words, to create an attractive way out for them and for you. What's a way forward here? And instead of pushing, what I see successful negotiators do is the exact opposite. They attract. Instead of making it harder for the other side, which is what we tend to do sometimes in difficult situations, you do the exact opposite. You make it easier for them. Your job is to make it easier for them, easier for them to make the decision you want them to make, easier for them to move in the direction you want them to move. So we need to leave our thinking for a moment which is not so easy sometimes, and start the conversation where their mind is. Listen to them. Try to put ourselves in their shoes and figure out what their needs are, what their fears are, so that you can find a way to address those needs while advancing your interests too. Well, one of my favorite exercises for doing that is to begin by, to begin the negotiation by, when you're preparing, by writing the other side's victory speech. It's a thought experiment. Imagine for a moment the other side has said yes to your proposal. Unbelievable, but they said yes. Now, they have to explain to the people they care about, their constituents, their board of directors, their union workers, whatever it is, why they said yes to your proposal. Imagine how that speech would go. What would be their three key points of that victory speech? Now, see your job as how can you help them deliver that victory speech? How do you make it so that they can be a hero in accepting your proposal? So whether it's asking your board for a decision or figuring out how to end a war, I find that that thought experiment of the victory speech can open up new creative possibilities that we hadn't imagined before. So that leads me to the third point, which is we often need to get some help. Because in today's conflicts, it's not so easy to go to the balcony. It's maybe hard. It's not easy to build a golden bridge. Uh, people are burning bridges. People aren't going to the balcony. They're often going to the gutter. No. So no matter how good we might be, we're going to need help. 
often lots of it. And here's the very common mistake we make when things get rough. We tend to reduce the conflict to two sides. It's us against them. It's union against management. It's sales against manufacturing. What we forget is that in any conflict, there's always a third side, which is the people around us, the colleagues, the friends, the family, the neighbors, the allies, the neutrals, even mediators, and so on. That third side constitutes a huge, untapped potential resource for transforming the conflict. It's like a container within which even the hardest conflicts can begin to give way to dialogue, to listening, and to negotiation. The people around us can help calm the people who are fighting. It can bring the parties together. It can, it can facilitate it. It can help them communicate. It can help them understand each other better. In other words, it can help them explore a way out, a golden bridge. And when the conflict is really hard, we may need a kind of community intervention. I call this a swarm. It's a term that often is used in Silicon Valley now for, you know, it's like a critical mass of persuasive influence and assistance. You swarm the conflict, you swarm the difficulty so that it can help the parties find a way through their difficulties. We need often to mobilize that third side to the surrounding community so that we can build what might be called a winning coalition or an agreement for a good way forward. After all these decades working in tough conflicts and wars, people often ask me, are you an optimist or are you a pessimist? And I like to answer that actually, I am a possibilist, a possibilist, because I believe in our human potential to transform even the toughest conflicts from destructive fights into creative negotiations. I believe it because I've seen it happen with my own eyes, in coal strikes, in bitter boardroom battles, in family feuds, and in many wars around the world. I've watched people unlock their hidden human potential and make the seemingly impossible become possible. So where there are obstacles, possibilists look for opportunities. It's a change in mindset. Possibilists aren't blind to the dark side of human nature. To be a possibilist means to look at the negative possibilities too, but then to use that perspective to motivate us to look for the positive possibilities that avert the worst and bring about the possible best. I've seen how conflict can bring out the worst in us, but I've also seen how it can bring out the best in us. So what was that single summary sentence I offered Jim Collins on that memorable mountain hike? It was the path to possible is to go to the balcony, get that perspective, build a golden bridge, find that way out, and engage the third side. Get the help that you need. All together, all at once. Here's the good news. Each of these three, each of these three potentials, it's an innate human potential. It's something we just need to remember and to develop. The choice is ours. And I, I hope you will make these three innate human potentials, balcony, bridge, and third side, which I think of as our superpowers, make them your close friends and allies. That's the way that we can navigate this age of conflict and realize the enormous opportunities that await us. Because I believe that if we can transform our conflicts, we can transform our workplaces, we can transform our lives, and we can transform our world. That's my dream. So I want to wish you every success in transforming your conflicts and getting to yes. I will now hand it off to Grace.